back, everyone, from lunch. I know that this is when people start to fall asleep. So we'll try to keep it lively. Maybe you guys can throw some chairs or something. Um, to kick it off, so this is the, the data-driven marketing playbook session. So essentially, we are going to talk about how do you put a process around various aspects of marketing. And uh, why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves just really briefly. So Nicola, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Mm. I'm Nicola. I'm VP of Marketing at GoCardless and the proud owner of some Slack socks, which I procured this morning. I was very excited about that. Um, GoCardless launched in 2011. We make it very simple to take recurring payments via direct debit in the UK or SEPA across the Eurozone. We work with over 20,000 businesses, and that ranges from small startups right up to the likes of Vox.com, Financial Times, Thomas Cook. And we're also integrated into most of the major cloud accounting and bidding platforms. So that includes Xero, FreeAgent, Zuora, and Chargebee, who I know are here today as well. Uh, hello, my name is Karen Flanagan. Um, I'm, uh, I work at HubSpot. Um, my background has basically been marketing and SaaS for a while. I've been at Salesforce, Marketo, uh, and now HubSpot. <clears throat> we sell marketing and sales software. Predominantly what I do is I run the marketing teams for, and the growth teams for our freemium products. So we have free marketing uh, and sales products. And we spend a lot of our time kind of focused on what Patrick Campbell uh, had earlier is acquisition, monetization, and somewhat retention. Cool. My name is Andrew Davies. I'm one of the co-founders of Idio. Um, so we're an enterprise SaaS play that uh, examines and analyzes the digital behavior of our clients' customers to predict their interests, their intent, and personalize that customer experience to drive up investments or product purchases. So we sell into large enterprises. Um, clients include JP Morgan, BlackRock, Intel, Bank of New York Mellon. So mostly in the wealth and asset management sector. Great. So we're going to kick it off. Uh, you know, when I was talking with these folks, one of the things that we discussed was around, you know, finding your target audience, obviously very important to marketers. And traditionally, this has been a very qualitative activity, like, you know, what is your target audience, et cetera. But I was surprised to learn that, you know, some of us are working on, uh, I'd say, putting a science behind this. So actually, Andrew, I know you have some interesting thoughts on this. Why don't you uh, share how you guys, how you guys pulled together your, your target audience? Sure, so I guess for us it's less, less about whether it was art or science in the execution, more about does the science prove that that blend is working or not. Mm -hmm. um, so if we reverse a year or so, um, we were doing a traditional marketing model, um, you know, talking to lots of people, hoping they became activated, and then qualifying them out if they weren't a good fit. Um, and it was horrific. I mean, you know, our conversion metrics weren't great. Uh, our deal cycles were long. Um, and we went through quite a painful process of really getting to know our custom customers again. So we did 30, 40 face-to-face -face or you know, phone call interviews, um, not just about our product, but about those people's pain points, their difficulties, their challenges, their day jobs, um, and rebuilt a proposition around an ICP, an ideal customer profile that we really then understood. And we, we deleted two-thirds of our marketing database at that point. Um, which was really painful for our marketing team because suddenly all the numbers went down. Um, but what it meant was we could focus on actually the, the behaviors and the interests of those people. Um, and as a result of making sure our messaging is more targeted for them, uh, making welcome programs that are better for them, and a sales proposition that's more targeted, we could really drive down that deal cycle and, and drive up the average contract value. So, so dive into that a little bit. And also because you guys are a startup, it is painful to say, oh, we're not going after this kind of customer, even though they were paying you, right? Yep. So, so how did you decide which segment of your existing customers were the right ones to go after? So it was really clear to us um, in the conversations we were having, like if we sign a, um, a large financial services institution with an 80 grand average order, then we know that there's 10 times that over the next few years because of the size of their business and the other departments and other products we can sell them. So a lot of it was based on that upsell potential. Whereas if we did exactly the same sell into a, a mid-market tech company, we just knew there wasn't that pathway. There wasn't a big enough problem to solve. Um, so that was mostly what it was. And also we found that that focus had other um, benefits that we weren't really foreseeing. For example, the, the idea of reference customers that are really relevant. Um, if I walk into JP Morgan and say we've got a deal with it, UNICEF, no one could care less. But if we walk into Morgan Stanley saying JP Morgan have just signed, suddenly it really makes a difference for them. Um, so that really helped us as well. 
So was it primarily like the size and the profile of the company or was it also like, were they saying certain things about their needs or their particular problems as well? Yeah, absolutely. So it's very much about the state they are in as well. So they've made, for us, it's people have made a very serious board level decision about investing in their customer experience. They're realizing in that industry, they're realizing they're getting killed by the, you know, the, the fintech startups, the, the, the wealth fronts and betterments, et cetera, and they know they have to change their customer experience. And if that is a board level, even in their, in their annual reports, if that's something they're talking about, we know that's a massive signal for us. Got it, okay. Do, do you guys have any um, interesting yeah. experiences <coughs> along this line? I think, I think there's two, a couple of interesting things about how you can target your personas, but also get consistent feedback, and it differs from like a traditional B2B model and a freemium model. So in a traditional B2B model, you have some sort of proof points where you can look to see if that person's responding to different parts of your marketing. Do they visit my site? Do they sign up to something I care about? And then you have your gatekeepers, or like the salespeople and the services people who give you constant feedback on those personas. And the interesting thing is when you move into a, a, a freemium model it, or a freemium product, it gets a lot easier to do this because you then have a lot of product usage data. So am I driving people in and I can build cohorts and see if like this cohort is using uh, features to a certain level or they're not using features and you can start to apply a lot more uh, science to kind of learn learning around who your who your audience is and you know how they actually use the product. And I guess the, the other hidden benefit we had which we were speaking about earlier is this whole sales and marketing divide and that's only disappeared as soon as we were actually closing the right kind of customers. So mm -hmm. You know, a year ago, my sales team hated my marketing team because <laughs> they had 20 meetings to look at and two of them might be relevant. Right. Uh -huh. Whereas now we're only going after that approved list. Um, it makes the whole organization smoother. Yeah, exactly. And I think from our side, when we really started to look into how our customers were using our product, what we realized is that some of our most valuable customers weren't using us directly. They were using us through a third party. And what we've been doing in the past was saying, fantastic integration with a partner. It's live. Let's leave it. Actually, we were missing out on a huge opportunity for us to work very, very closely with them to do some joint marketing mm -hmm. to grow the businesses together. Interesting. Okay. Well, great. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, and let's talk about KPIs. I know that um, you know there are a lot of startups in the audience, and people are trying to figure out their KPIs. And Nicola, you had mentioned that when you joined Go Cardless, one of the first things that you did was to look at the KPIs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. I think there's three really important things when you're looking at KPIs. I think the first one is that they absolutely have to be aligned to your business objectives. Um, they've really got to give you insight into your business health and your business performance. And I think it's very easy to get sidelined by what I would call vanity metrics that make your business look great, but don't actually tell you anything about your performance. I mean, one number that I love to say is, we've taken over 1.5 billion pounds worth of payments for our merchants. It's a great number to go out there. It's always a good excuse to throw a party, but it doesn't actually tell me anything about how my business is doing. So my KPI is about monthly recurring revenue, not what my merchants are doing. So that's really important. I think the second thing as well is that we had rather a lot of KPIs, and it's actually <laughs> keeping them streamlined. There's so much data out there that what you can end up with is tracking too much which means you've almost got paral paralysis. Like, I don't know where to start. So you end up spending most of your time prioritizing your KPIs to even work out what you should start actioning. So keep it lean. Um, I think someone was saying this morning, no startup is ever accused of being too focused, and it applies to this as well. And I think the third thing, um, which, which we've seen even, I've only been at GoCardus for just over a year and, and has changed since I've been there, is you've got to keep reevaluating them. Because as the business changes and your priorities change, you've got to make sure that the KPIs tie in with that too. So when I joined, we've always predominantly been focused on our self-serve product. So the marketing KPI was about generating signups to our self-serve product. Now, two years ago, we launched our pro product, and that's all about generating leads to our sales team. So you've got an immediate disconnect there, exactly what you were saying, where I'm focusing on sign-ups, and the sales team is saying, well, I want leads. I've got targets for qualified leads. So what we've done is change that so I have a sign-up target, but I also have a qualified lead target, which I work on with the sales team. And suddenly, you've got the two teams working together. So, so let's dive into that a little bit more, because actually, this is really relevant for startups. Like, how do you know you have the right KPIs? Like, how, how often should you be reevaluating this? There's so many things going on. And, and, and actually, how many KPIs do you guys have at GoCardless? It depends on the department. I would say, for us, we're really looking at about five. So you're looking at, at sign-ups, qualified leads. You're looking at monthly recurring revenue. We're looking at um, churn. And we're also looking at lifetime value. And then I have a marketing-specific one around cost per acquisition. 
I see. And, and since you have a handful, are there ones that you prioritize over others? Like, oh, I got to really fix this. We review them on a weekly basis in our management meeting. And then we have the whole management team looking at those. And what we found over time is that there'll be some that we're saying, right, actually, there's some really actionable insights from this. And there's some we're saying, well, we're not really using this data, so let's look at something else. One thing we're talking about at the moment is we're not currently tracking NPS. Now, as our database gets bigger, it's more important for us to have much better insight into customer feedback. And so that's something we're going to start tracking on a weekly basis, too. Now, do you guys ever get into arguments about oh, well, I think we should really work on churn versus, oh, no, let's focus on our you know, MRR. Uh, is, that, is there ever a conflict on that, especially when you're talking about bringing in other team leads or management? I think <laughs> the main one was actually around sign-ups and qualified leads because you're switching the focus. You're saying, I really want to focus on the small startups where we're opening up direct debit for them, or no, we're really going to focus on the medium and larger size businesses. And it's about which one takes priority. So, so that's been a discussion point, I would say. And, <laughs> and we know the business, as it evolves, we need to focus much more on, on generating quality leads for the sales team. So that's where we're switching to. OK. And, and not to pry too much, but um, when there are conflicts around, oh, we think this KPI should be higher priority or whatnot, how do those get resolved? Is it head of marketing who resolves it, or the CEO? Or how do you think that needs to bubble up? I think it's really important to have conflict in these meetings because at the end, everyone has to buy into it. And if everyone's just sat there going, yeah, sure, whatever, it, it means that they're not actually going to, to really focus on that. Um, so it's, it's as a group. And I think you really, at the end of the day, have to say what's best for the business, not what's best for me or for my department. Mm -hmm. And that's how you make the decision. Mm -hmm. You guys want to jump in on how, how do you guys look at KPIs and, and how do you evolve them? So I, th I think some of the things you can do if you're a SaaS company to grow faster is actually simplify the metrics you look at. If you have some simplification of metrics and you have uh, agreement that these are the most important metrics that we need to focus on over the next six months and then give people the autonomy they need and the resources they need to actually really go after those metrics, I think it matters more than a lot of other things that you can do within your business to grow faster. I think too often, with, especially within SaaS, you can look at like all the numbers and not know what are the maybe three things that you should just focus on. If you focus on those things, you could 5x your business. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned about having too many KPIs, and they do just become PIs in marketing, don't they? There's nothing actually key about them. Um, but I think, I think for me, it's, it's more about the communication process of how you change them. I think particularly in marketing where you can find another level or another slice of that funnel very, very easy to measure. Um, is how you communicate to the whole business what you are actually being responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's something that goes beyond marketing. That's something that needs to be on a central dashboard that people understand what you're being held to account on. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess as, as long as when they change, it's very well transparently communicated, and you're honest about why, um, yeah, then you're okay. Okay. Cool. So another big part of marketing is experimentation, of course. And you know, there are so many experiments you could be doing in marketing. So um, how do you prioritize experiments? How do you, what's your framework like for doing experiments? How do, you, how do you best utilize your time? Kieran, I know you guys do a lot. Yeah, so we, we, we try to run in some, in some type of a growth model. And we try to pick experiments either applicable to acquisition, monetization, or in somewhat retention, but retention any kind of growth model is the, one of the most complex parts because it's a metric owned by a bunch of different teams. Um, and there's four kind of key things that we've learned probably over the last 12 months of trying to run this model. What helps you to really get into uh, a culture of experiments? That, the first one is like to have some type of model of how you prioritize experiments. So we use a model called PI. It's actually borrowed from a, an agency called Wider Funnel in Canada who do conversion rate optimization. We've kind of altered it a little bit. And PI really stands for prioritization of experiments, the uh, impact that experiment could have, and the ease uh, of how you can actually implement that experiment. So we score individual experiments under <coughs> each of those parameters and then get an, get an average. Um, and that really helps us to try to focus on the experiments that are going to have the highest impact for the business and are actually the easiest things for us to implement. The second thing we've learned, we ran that model for a while, and what we found was that to really be effective at this, you need to tie potential to a real number. So if you could build, uh, you should build like a predictive model of your funnel, and then you can figure out how experiments will actually change that model. So to give you an example, if I simplify part of our funnel, 
we would look at the number of people that would visit our different sign-up pages. We could look at the click-through rate on those sign-up pages. We could look at the number of people who go through our free sign-up flow, the number of people then who create uh, an account, the number of people who consume our onboard on emails and become what we call a weekly active team. It's one of the metrics that we look at. And then how many people actually consume our in-app messaging and become what we really care about, which is like product qualified leads or a touch the sale. So it's monetization of those free users. And the interesting thing is when you do that, you use benchmarks, and I can say, well, hey, I've got an experiment, and I think I can increase my visits from orga organic by 5,000 visits a month. And I drop that number into my predictive model, and I see how many additional product qualified leads or touch the sales that actually generates. Or I can look at how do I increase the number of people who consume my onboarding emails, and if I increase that by 10%, how many weekly active teams or PQLs does that, does that increase to? And by doing that, you can tie that potential to an actual tangible result and really helps you to prioritize the right experiments to actually work on. The third thing that we've really learned is, like, it's kind of cliche to say build a culture of it being OK to fail. But the thing that we've learned is actually building a culture of failing really fast and then being successful helps really helps a lot. And I, I really do believe there's a kind of new breed of marketer that beats traditional marketers in, in, a, in a lot of ways. And one of the ways they really beat traditional marketers is when they're in a meeting, they're not thinking about, what is the final version of this thing? And I think too many people get caught up as like, I'm going to create the perfect version of this thing, and I'm going to leave it there for six to 12 months and never look at it again. And what these kind of marketers do is they think, what is the minimal viable version of this thing? And I will iterate and test on this over time to make it better. And they may fail the first three to four times they do that, but they will, they will eventually beat those results and be a lot more successful. And the last thing that I've learned, and I, I really believe in this in terms of like, the future of marketing teams, is to build some type of, especially for startups, is to build like an elastic type marketing team. And what I mean by that is hire marketers who, are not, who don't have one specific skill set. So if you think of a SaaS funnel, and I really care about acquisition, I really care about monetization, I really care about retention, then I should hire marketers who can work on any one of those problems at any given time. And it means that at every three to six months, I can reformat my team to focus on one big problem and try to solve that problem, rather than having someone who's, who does SEO or does email or does content. And that's really the only skill set they have. Like you can hire a great SEO, but the best thing to do is hire someone who can also translate those skills to other areas within the funnel. And that's what we kind of really learned over the, over the last 12 months. Oh, that's interesting. That's very differentiated. Uh, actually, tell me a little bit more about your process at, at HubSpot. Like, when you guys are coming up with experiments, is it a team effort? Everyone's brainstorming? Who does the prioritization? You or other people? How so does that work? We have uh, e each of the marketers who kind of work on the growth. So not every person on my team would have an experiment funnel, but most of the marketers would have an experiment funnel. So they have an individual funnel that kind of looks like a marketing funnel. So the thing that growth people are really good at is actually ideas for experiments. I don't think you'll ever hire a growth, real growth marketer and be short of ideas. They want to experiment on everything. That's why they, they're so good. But they go through a process where they have ideas. We do all this actually in, in Trello. Um, growth Hackers, Sean Ellis's uh, growthhackers.com have just released a tool called Projects, which kind of automates some of this. But we have a, you'll go into ideas, and then they have to go through this process where they run analysis. And what they're doing on the analysis side is trying to build that predictive outcome to get that pi score. And then they'll pi score that from potential impact ease. And then they'll move the top priority ones into um, running. And then they'll have to analyze that and document an outcome. And that all goes into a shared experiment board in Trello. So everyone can kind of sort through that and see what people have run. And what we try and do, what I try and do, is give people the autonomy to do their own experiments. So if I'm in a meeting with someone and they're talking me through their experiment, I will try to guide them, but I will never say, don't do that, even though I think it's a shitty idea. <laughs> and I've been wrong more times than I've been right. When I have thought it's a really shitty idea, it's, it's, usually, it's usually beating what I think it would do. And I think that's the thing that separates growth from traditional marketing is you don't assume. You just you go by the data. You go by the results. And um, you know, so you have all this stuff in your Trello board then. And let's say you bring on board somebody new into your team. Uh, is there a way to kind of easily sort through past experiments? Or how do you do knowledge transfer? Yeah, so we have it, we have it filtered in a bunch of different ways. So you can go in and filter either by experiments run for different products and then look at them by, fast, by past, fail, and inconclusive. So they could go consume that knowledge, see what's been run before. Um, so there's a lot of ways that they can actually go source 
Well, there, there, we have, uh, it's kind of crazy, we have a, a Google folder with about a thousand different experiments documented. <laughs> we moved off that because what we found was the documentation was becoming so time consuming that people were like, oh, I don't want to run too many more experiments. And we moved to a model where you only have to write like three or four lines. So if I'm going into that Trello board, I can kind of understand what the experiment was in the result, but I don't need to read a 10 page document of like all of the hypotheses and the different thinking that actually went into that. But it means someone can scale up really fast. That's interesting. I'm, I'm intrigued. Which experiment that was successful were you most surprised by? That I was most surprised by? Um, I've been surprised by, I've been surprised by, the, the thing that I have become passionate about is copy. Like, we've, we've done things where someone has come to me and says, I want to add six words to our free trial page. I'm like, oh, I think we, I look at the pie score, and I think, mm, I think we could do something bigger. And when we split test that, we have 20% more signups as a result. It took <laughs> them, like, 10 minutes to think of the six words. So the, the, <laughs> The, the results of that are, are phenomenal. And I think my brain goes, oh, this isn't complex enough. It's not big enough. It's only six words. Why are we doing that? We should do something really insane, something big. Um, so the, the things I've been surprised by is the small things can really have a greater impact. Sometimes complex experiments like split testing your onboarding flow, split testing at least if things work. But sometimes very, very small things can have a very, very big impact, and usually through copy. What were the six words? <laughs> I'm going to uh, copy them. <laughs> okay, so, I, so I probably won't get this exactly right. It's uh, no credit card required. <laughs> uh, this will be direct debit, I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. You guys want to jump in? Do, is there, um... I'll, be, I'll be interested in knowing how you budget for it, because I, th I think this is one thing where you do that shift from traditional marketing into experimental marketing. If you go out with your annual plan, it's very difficult in Q3 build that to build yeah. that into it. And we find, certainly with some of the, the marketing departments we're working with, they're stuck in that cycle. Sometimes they're in a multi-year plan, and right. they're trying to be innovative, they're trying to be experimental. They've got their hands are completely tied. So how do you, how do you factor that yeah, in? Yes, so I, I think if you look at a marketing plan and you model out your next 12 months growth, you'll see there's certain channels that are linear that have, that have peak points, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, in a, you're in a niche market and part of your acquisition strategy is through paid and you're reliant on AdWords. And you know that actually one of the things you can do is run these things what we call burst tests. The burst test is I will just spend more money than I ever would, but I'm trying to f figure out the ceiling. Yeah. And I know my ceiling and I can model that out. So you can start to actually see at what point your marketing growth or your acquisition growth plateaus. Yep. And then you need to build in a buffer of like, I know that I'm going to hit like a wall here and I actually don't know how to grow for the next 12 months. I should start factoring a percentage of my marketing team to like figure out this problem mm -hmm. and make sure I have the right people who can actually figure that out. Um, and, w and when you move into the funnel monetization and retention, it's just com it's an actually iterative process. It's when you're, especially when you're in a freemium business, you have to constantly run those tests yeah. to, try to, to try to improve those metrics. Yeah, so actually that's a good segue into our last topic, which is on lead qualification. How do you guys do your lead scoring? And I also, because I, I know that all three of your companies have been startups at different stages, has that changed over time? Like in the beginning, if you have no leads, do you even qualify them at all? Or how, how do you guys think about that? Uh, fr from our side, we probably do it a little bit uniquely in that we're, we're selling into enterprise, and so buying's a team sport. You know, no one ever signs off on one of our contracts without there being probably five, six people involved in that decision. Um, so our marketing team, our metric is, is not marketing qualified leads, but marketing qualified accounts. And so our, our marketing team have to get three potential decision makers at any account before that's qualified through to sales. Um, and so it's lead score plus the lead score across three people out of that account. And did you back into that based on your sales? Or? So we did that at the same time as we flipped that funnel uh -huh. um, when we realized that that was what we were seeing. When we looked in our, so we used Pardot, and when we, when we look at that deal lifecycle, we could see that the, the cluster of people was developing towards the signature. Mm -hmm. um, and so we realized that was something we needed to replicate, and so that's what we targeted marketing on. Mm -hmm. So for, our, for us, our SELs qualify our leads, but what we actually do is we score our sign-ups because some of the companies that actually sign up to our self-serve product, we have a huge opportunity to upsell to them. So we do that by using information that they're giving us. So we ask questions like, um, how many transactions do you do a month? We use data about the type of email address they have. Anyone that has Gmail or Hotmail is immediately out. <laughs> um, and also about the type of business. And then we use a solution called Clearbit, which gives us more information on 
the type of business they have and the size of it based on using sources from LinkedIn, Companies House, how many Twitter followers they have. And then based on the overall score, it may be escalated to the sales team to say, actually, we think this could be a very, very high quality lead. So call them up. Actually, um, you know, there's a lot of software out there that does this kind of lead scoring. Have you, used, have you tried other software before? How do you decide? How do you know if it's any good? I'll be honest, it was, it was in place when I joined a year ago, <laughs> so I, I can't really compare and contrast. It seems to do the job very well, but I couldn't say that it was better or worse than anything else. I don't know what you guys use. Yeah, so we have our, we have our own lead score, and we do use third party. We have lead scoring based upon demographic data, technology we're using, and then we've started to add in some type of behavior on our traditional B2B funnel, which is like the pages you visit on the site and some plastic things like that. On our freemium side, what we're starting to look at is really a product you should score. Um, and I think the interesting thing is when you have a kind of traditional funnel and a freemium funnel, you can kind of mash together both product you should score and actual traditional lead, lead, uh, lead, lead uh, score and demographic data. To, and I think it's, it's interesting when you start to look at those two things combined. And uh, when, when you talk about score, like how do you guys do your scoring? So we, so, so we have like bands, uh, let's say hundreds of perfect leads, in, in, in the kind of, if it's a lead model, hundreds of perfect lead, zero is the worst kind of lead. If you ring these people, uh, you should be shot because they're not gonna buy your, your, your products. And then we just kind of have bands. What we did is we went through like 80%, 60%, 40%, and we came up with lead rotation rules to rotate some, some of these people to different types of sales reps. And we did this over a 12 month period and then tested to see what the close rates were on those different cohorts uh, based upon that lead score. Uh, we have ourselves, like we got ourselves into a pretty good space and, and the, you know, teaching the lead score and algorithm over time what the perfect uh, ideal fit customer was for us. And did you rotate who is on these different customers' accounts based on the specialty of the rep or the persona of the rep or so, anything Yeah, like so, like, so, 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 your, so your reps who, you want to, like you have some reps that pay better than other reps, right? <laughs> so you, you, you want to make sure the people you're paying money are spending their time trying to close deals and then you have uh, other reps who are spending their time qualif qualifying um, those leads and passing, passing them up. And we did that based upon our, our lead scores. So like this person should go straight to a rep because they're ready for a call, we know. This is a good fit customer. This person should go for a different type of rep. They should actually qualify themselves, have a conversation, see if, they, see if we can really, really help that person. I see. And then uh, you had mentioned scoring based on usage of the freemium product. Do you, how do you guys figure out sort of the scoring of, oh, these people use this feature nine times or that yeah, sort of thing? Yeah, I, I think the product usage thing is, is really interesting. It comes back to everyone knows the Facebook story of you know, adding X number of friends in the first week you're gonna be a lot more successful. And I think it's working, like what are the things that that person does within the set first seven days to 14 days that would, like the commonalities that would determine or dictate that they're actually gonna become a successful user of your product. So you backtrack through like, successful customers who are using your product and look, th look through what they've done in the first seven to 14 days. And what we obsess over is trying to find the first three to, f three to four things that that person does, the features they use. And then we would build that into like a, a product user score. And because they're, the activities that we want that person to do, so it leads your onboarding, your leads your in-app messaging. You want those persons to actually do those things. Yep. All right. Well, I think we are out of time, but um, thank you so much to all of our panelists, and uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.